A1 Grand Prix, the World Cup of motorsport, was proving to not only be popular but also quite successful with teams and hugely successful with fans. There were new races all around the world. The series concept was to pit nation against nation rather than team against team or manufacturer against manufacturer. The idea was that the team's drivers, sponsors and team management would all come from the nation in question. Ahead of the fourth season of the championship, the owners of A1 GP felt that they needed to replace their tried and tested F3000 based Lola cars with an all new car. This is the story of A1 GP powered by Ferrari. There's lots of stories and references out there that the second generation A1 GP car was actually based on the Ferrari F2004 or even that it was a modified F2004 chassis. But that's simply not true. The car was in fact a bespoke design which didn't use any Ferrari Formula One parts whatsoever. In fact the car wasn't even made in Italy, it was made in England. Indeed Ferrari was not even willing to design or manufacture the A1 GP chassis. It was truly just powered by Ferrari. Initially, when A1 GP decided it needed a new car, the championship's technical team approached Lola, Dallara and Panos about making the car. But all of those manufacturers told A1 GP that there simply wasn't enough time to design and build the car to A1 GP's really compressed timetable. In fact, the lead time was so short, nobody really thought it could be done at all. It's a curious statement though from Panos in particular, which was well advanced with the Super League Formula car, so we'll have to get back to that. This became a big problem problem for A1GP which had no chassis manufacturer, no design and no factory and despite that they decided to press on regardless. It was decided by A1GP's technical team that URT Composites in southern England would actually do the composite manufacturing and on a visit to see that facility it was discovered by the A1GP management that there was an empty industrial unit next to the URT facility and that very quickly became the A1GP factory. However it was just an empty shell. The whole factory had to be built up from scratch in almost no time at all and there was the small matter of needing to design the car. English engineer John Travis was hired to design it. He'd worked for years at Lola before moving to Penske to design open wheel cars including the PC27. He also penned the Ypsilon Euskadi LMP1 car. There was a connection to the Ferrari F2004 design as well as Ferrari designer Rory Byrne did consult on the A1 GP car but exactly how much direct input he had was not really clear. The core part of the new car then was that it was powered by Ferrari, but Ferrari was not willing to offer the series a bespoke racing engine. In fact, the only bespoke racing engine it made was its Formula One engine, and it certainly wasn't going to give that to A1GP. Instead, it offered up a unit based on the F136 engine. This was a 90 degree normally aspirated V8 family of engines with capacities ranging from 4.3 litres up to 4.7 litres. The base engine had been been used in various Maserati models such as the Quattroporte but also some Ferrari models including the 430 and notably the 458. It was the 458 engine that was lent directly to A1GP's project. That A1GP version of the F136 engine was a 4.5 litre variant featuring direct injection. Even in A1GP form it was a particularly heavy engine at 160 kilograms. The crankshaft centre line height was also quite high as was the overall centre of gravity. Gravity height. Notably though, the Ferrari engine was more powerful than the Zytec engine used in the Lolas as the Ferrari was capable of 650 brake horsepower. Ferrari didn't want to make a bespoke sump for its production car engine to suit the A1GP car, so A1GP just had to use what they were given. And that's part of the reason that the centre of gravity height was so high on that engine. Cooling the engine was also a challenge with the new car design as the production derived V8 had much higher internal friction than a bespoke racing engine would have done like the Zytec. The weight of the engine became a major challenge in the design of the car because the weight distribution with an engine that big was very much rearward and A1GP didn't really want that because it didn't want a tricky oversteery car. This would not be the first one make open wheel design from John Travis since he'd left Lola. He'd also and I think quite crucially penned the unraced Formula Superfund car. The Superfund car is worth looking at as well because I think the A1GP car owes an awful lot of its design to the 
Formula Superfund car, even with the Ferrari-inspired changes that we're going to take a look at. Aerodynamic development on the new car was conducted using the University of Southampton wind tunnel in England, using a 40% scale model. Travis knew this wind tunnel really quite well, as it was based on the old Penske wind tunnel equipment he'd used to develop open wheel cars when he worked there, such as the PC27. In total, two to three weeks were spent in the wind tunnel developing the new A1 car. As I mentioned earlier on, URT Composites was responsible for all of the composites work on the car, and the chassis featured a conventional two-part monocoque with the upper and lower halves bonded together. URT still had to work flat out to get the parts of the new A1 GP cars ready in time for the start of the season, while still servicing its normal customer base. Perhaps because of the short lead time of the project, the first chassis actually failed its side impact test at the first attempt, and the car had to be modified slightly and then resubmitted. It did eventually pass those tests, but the chassis also had to be lengthened slightly during that process, meaning the very first chassis really wasn't actually very usable. The new A1 Grand Prix car rolled out for its first official shakedown at Ferrari's Fiorano test track, though I think it actually quietly ran in the UK a little bit first before it went off to Italy for that public shakedown. The aim of the overall design of the car was to have a car which looked like a proper Grand Prix car, but was not as sensitive or as tricky to operate or drive, and it was meant to be far more suitable as a one-make racer. Overall, the car had a lower centre of gravity than the Lola did, and the weight distribution was actually slightly further forward, and both of these are quite impressive considering that the Zytec engine in the Lola was 40 kilograms lighter than the Ferrari engine in the back of the new A1 GP car. Overall, the car tipped the scales at 695 kilograms wet, but that doesn't include the driver. One of the design objectives, as I mentioned, was to make the car look like a proper Grand Prix car, and the Grand Prix car they had in mind was indeed the Ferrari F2000. And indeed, John Travers apparently was provided with some design data of the F2004 from Ferrari, but only really to help with the styling of the car. Looking at the car, there is a deliberate resemblance between the F2004 and the A1 GP car, and it's pretty clear to see. The nose shape is aesthetically very similar, albeit different in terms of size and scale. The front wing, though, is far more simple on the A1 GP car than it was on the Ferrari. Even the front brake duct is really similar between the two cars. The aerodynamic elements ahead of the rear wheels are far more simple on the A1 GP car, which also lack the additional winglets used on the Ferrari in that part of the bodywork. The roll hoop shape is very much the same, as is the towing slot behind it, and that was a clear choice to make the car look like the Ferrari. The winglets on the roll hoop on the Ferrari, though, were completely absent on the A1 GP car. The bargeboard shape, again, is clearly inspired by the Ferrari F2004, as is the shape of the side pod duct. Gone are those very swoopy side pod ducts of the Lola. The fin on the engine cover, notably, was something that didn't appear on the F2004, and it was fitted to the A1 GP car simply to increase space for sponsorship logos, and it didn't have any real aerodynamic function. Note the huge bulge on the engine cover, and that's there just to house that very large V8 engine. Not great aerodynamically, but in a spec series, it's the same for everybody. At first glance, the rear wing does look like a Ferrari F2004 part. Note the shape of the upper element, particularly on the outer end of the wing, but the profiles do appear to be actually quite different, and the A1 GP wing does seem to be a bit smaller. The cooling chimneys on the bodywork are almost identical between the two cars. I'm not sure if the A1 GP car actually needed them, or if they were just really there for styling. Interestingly, Michelin tyres replaced the outsized Cooper Avon tyres used on the Lola. Despite this, Michelin still had to make bespoke rear tyres for the new A1 car because it was a little bit overloaded at the rear due to the weight of the engine and its 650 brake horsepower output. The suspension layout was conventional on the new car with a double wishbone layout with pushrod actuated spring and damper units all round. However, the internal suspension layout really shows up how different the A1 GP car is to the Ferrari F2004. With conventional twin dampers and third elements with coil springs on the A1 car, the Ferrari of course used a way more advanced torsion bar setup and looked nothing like the A1 GP car under the bodywork. Unlike the Lola, the second generation of A1 car used carbon-carbon brakes. The Lola used steel brakes, though these were considered to be long-life parts from Brembo and they were expected to last 3,500 kilometers before they needed to be changed. So they were more likely to be sports car racing designs in origin than Formula One origins. Under the bodywork, the engine installation looked pretty conventional, but there were some interesting elements. On the Lola, the oil tank was located between the engine and 
the transmission, but on the new car it was located in the more conventional location at the rear of the tub. The transmission was a six-speed longitudinal design made by Extract with a bespoke magnesium casing. The ratios inside that casing were based on those used in the Lola. Well, we're looking at quite a high specification of gearbox here. Uh, we now have a longitudinal gearbox uh, rather than a transverse, uh, and we have an integral bell housing with slightly bigger casing. There's also been some challenges to uh, mate it to suit the Ferrari engine. A triple plate carbon clutch from AP Racing transmitted drive, but notably that high crankshaft centerline height on the Ferrari V8 meant that the gearbox needed some input drop gears. Now that also helped with reducing the torque slightly through the gearbox and improving durability. 25 cars were built, fewer than the original Lola order of 50 cars, and that was perhaps a sign of what was to come for A1 Grand Prix. The initial deal with Ferrari was set to last six years, but it wouldn't last anything like that long. The cost and complexity of the new car was much higher than the Lola. For example, Ferrari was adamant that there could be no public engine failures, so each car had two Ferrari supplied technicians on hand at all times when it ran. When you start thinking there's 20 plus cars out there, that's 40 or more Ferrari staff members going everywhere that A1 GP went. That's not cheap. And this hinted at the fact that there was a fundamental problem with the A1 GP powered by Ferrari car, one that was actually slightly unrelated to the car or its design. The biggest issue was that the team simply didn't want it. Indeed, 90% of the teams apparently told the series management that they didn't want to use the new car and that the Lolas should be retained. The teams felt that the car was too expensive to run and it was too much too soon for the championship, which was only just going into its fourth season. There were suggestions as well that the overall concept of the design was also a mistake. Copying the look and bodywork of a famous Ferrari meant that the series lost its unique aesthetic it just looked a little bit like a copycat car which is what it was and also shaping the car like a car which raced in an era of formula one where it was incredibly hard to overtake for aerodynamic reasons just look up dirty air this had the entirely predictable effect of making overtaking much harder in a1 gp which made the races less exciting so with all of that in mind it's probably no great surprise that the first season of a1 gp powered by ferrari the fourth season of of A1GP was the final season of A1GP. It was due to start in September 2008, but the full fleet of new cars wasn't actually ready in time for the scheduled first race at Mugello. But when it did get going at Zandvoort in October, only 17 cars were on the grid, but then 20 turned up for the second race. However, not every single team survived the season, and this highlighted some of the other financial issues in that championship. The Korean entry, for example, contested the first two racing events and attempted to run at the third event before car problems stopped it from taking part in qualifying or the races and a shortage of spare parts elsewhere in the paddock meant that other teams came and cannibalized the Korean car throughout the rest of that weekend and it was never seen again. The entries from Canada and Pakistan never took part in the championship at all and the German team only appeared at the last two events. A1 Team Great Britain collapsed financially before the end of the season and another team had to run the car for the final few races. So overall the championship itself was a bit of a mess. In fact, there were a large number of races being cancelled. Races in Indonesia, Mexico and Brazil were all cancelled, leaving the seventh event of the season at Brands Hatch in May 2009 as the season finale, and actually the A1 GP finale. It does seem a bit fitting that A1 GP ended at the very track it began at, and that really was the end of A1 GP. But what really killed it was financial mismanagement. Teams would have to prepare cars at the A1 GP facility, and they would be shipped by the series around the world and the teams wouldn't actually have access to them between the races. Two 747 cargo planes would ship the entire championship to every venue around the world and ultimately that is where the series fell down. The debts owed to the shipping company and indeed others just got too big and the series collapsed financially with all of the series cars and equipment being put up for sale to cover the debt to the shipping company. When sales of the cars were not really forthcoming the cars were essentially put into storage for a long time and forgotten about. A1 GP was very much dead and the purpose-built second generation cars with only a single seasons of racing on them, they were largely forgotten. That was until 2015, when 21 of them were seemingly purchased by a South African organisation called Afrix Grand Prix or Af 
Afrix GP. It planned to use them as the basis of a new Pan-African racing series along the lines of A1 GP. The new owners of the cars got at least one of them running. They repainted it and they were testing it in South Africa. Some minor modifications were made to the car before this. The Morelli engine management system had to be replaced by units from Life Racing as the Morelli systems were not actually sold with the cars. We've redesigned the whole electrical system from the wiring loom to the ECU to the dash display system and all of the ancillaries that you need to run a race car. Our new GPS system, it's a 50 hertz uh, GPS system with built in six axis um, motion pack so we get three axis accelerometer and a three axis gyro and the teams can use that to analyse any data they want in the car. There was a move to introduce higher cockpit sides to the cars along with enhanced side protection systems as Zylon panel on the monocoques but I'm not sure that was ever done. The Promise series launch and the first race seemed to continually not actually happen. At the beginning the 2017 season was promoted as being the first year but after various postponements the series last announcement was that it would start in 2020 or 2022, but that too has obviously not happened. In 2023, it was announced that a new series, which was a World Cup of Motorsport, would be revived by the Origin Sports Group. It would be called A1 Grand Prix, but that too has not yet materialised, and the first race expected to have taken place in December 2024, you guessed it, it never happened. Today, at least some of the A1 GP powered by Ferrari cars have undergone restoration at the Torino Racing Facility in Mooresville, North Carolina with the hope of starting a brand new one-make racing championship in 2026. And this time it might actually work. Let's wait and see. If you've enjoyed this probably unnecessary, overly expensive and complex second chapter to the A1 GP story, then don't forget to hit like and subscribe. And I'll see you soon somewhere in the pit lane.